I hope that you all had a good week. I know I did. This has really been an interesting week. So tonight we're going to have a visit with a psychologist to see if he can help us out. I've been collecting uh, suttas from lists of psychological suttas, and it's kind of interesting that uh, there are so many that you can draw from. Some of them I'm having a little difficulty finding the psychological point, <laughs> because some of them are really designed for the person who really doesn't know the story about the Buddha, and maybe gets enlightened from some of the stories about how things very first began. But I've also had several questions come in this week in reference, uh, once again, to the situation that people are facing with COVID in living situations with parents and children and relatives all moving together. And I decided to take a couple of these uh, suttas and put together an interesting visit to Buddha Gautama, the family psychologist. So that's what's happening here tonight. So I'm gonna put you on the screen because I know you like to have this and we'll follow what's been put together in this adventure. Hmm. I don't see it. Let's see if I have it. There you go. Oops, no, I don't think that's for you. Wait a second. Bunty, can you see this okay, Bunty? No, I cannot see it. No, I don't think I did it right. I did something wrong. When you moved something, I could see something was going up about. Can you move the page up and down? Um, yeah, I can, but I think this is in Word. I don't think something happened. Let me let Maybe me try this to. Is, uh, I think this I is the board, board. Yeah, I'm on the board, but I think I have to fix this. Um, okay, let me. Um, not sure. I, I turn on the Word document and I open it up, right? And then I go on Zoom and it should be there. Correct? Yeah, share screen, share screen, and then uh, you select the document. Okay, just a second. So I have it open in Word now. So I should be able to come back to you. Go yeah. to share screen. There we go. Now I see it. Hmm. Now you see it? Yes? Yes. Okay, that's good. I'm going to need to hear you a little bit better. So first of all, I think the most important thing that people need to understand about the Dhamma, because I know that the Dhamma is learned to different extents in different settings. And um, in some families, they may be exposed to Sunday school, and they may be, be not not exposed that much to a sutta study where they actually go into the text and actually go into the Buddha and his Dhamma and find the stories themselves to get answers. So if this isn't happening, this is this is going to be interesting for you because this is coming from the Majima Nikaya. This first little piece here, this is from the Samyutta Nikaya from the Upanisa Sutta in the beginning, but the rest of this is coming out of a sutta that is called the Kinti Sutta. It's number 103 in the Majjhima Nikaya. And it, um, it basically, what that the title actually means is, what do you think about me? So sometimes when we're living in situations where groups of people are together, 
one or two people. It can be a young person, it can be an older person, or it can be uh, the middle age, it doesn't make any difference. The personality is very concerned with what about me, what about me in this situation. And so you, you have an imbalance, harmony, that happens in the group or the household. So let's just try to go through this whole thing. And I think I set it up the right way. So it, we should be able to get through this in about an hour and five minutes. So how do we learn the Dhamma? That's the question. How do we learn this Dhamma? Well, just as the rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountaintop, the water flows down along the slopes and fills the cleft, the gullies and the creeks. And these being full, they fill up the pools. And these being full, fill up the lakes. And these being full, fill up the streams. These being full, fill up the rivers. And these being full, fill up the great ocean. One of the expressions in Buddhism is to reach the ocean of wisdom. And it's interesting because the whole thing is flowing downstream and it's an effortless effort to allow it to happen, to abandon trying to control it and just steer and learn the basic foundation pieces of the teaching so that you understand uh, what is going on and not try to manhandle it, control it, make it happen, force it to happen the way you want it to be, but step back. This expression is the statement that happens near the end of the Upanisha Sutta. This is how we learn Dhamma. Patience leads to Nibbana, we are told and full understanding of how everything actually works is what comes out of the other side. The psychological advisor side of Gotama Buddha offers a system of knowledge and experience that leads to a life of prevention through wisdom in his approach in psychology. Some people call it Buddhology. We have to go to the suttas for our answers, apply them into our life and take um, what is operating for us to relieve our suffering in life. Recently, I, as I said, I had several calls from um, not just one or two, it all happened in, in clusters, you know, difficulties with young people and parents who are facing the COVID-19 lockdowns. And um, this has been the largest recorded universal lockdown situation for the entire human race. Uh -huh. How about that? Recorded in any history uh, chapter. The question is, does the Buddha have any applicable forms of relief through the suttas themselves that we can find and apply in our own situations today? Now, I'm going to go over several of these suttas in the next few weeks, but this one's the first one. So this is an example one we're going to visit. So the questioner comes and says, I came to ask you what I should do to help my family get along better and work together as a team to get through COVID-19. I'm having trouble with my teenager children, and I'm not sure how to handle this. Some of the grades are slipping and communication is tense in the family because some grades are beginning to fall down. Meditation and the Brahma Viharas can help in such situations, he answers. So how can meditation help in a situation like this? Well, first we have to look at what the meditation turned out to be that the Buddha was teaching. We know that the monks were trying to reach the proper conditions so they could experience Nibbana. That was their main objective. In order to do this, they first have to learn how to communicate with their brain so that they, it will carry their intentions as they lean 
toward wholesome directions. This is different for them. It's different for any human being once you start to get into this, to think that the brain can actually work in, in a team effort for you, with you. How can we do that, the questioner asks. We have to set up trust with the brain. It's been working very hard to help protect us through our life. And as we begin to communicate with it now, we're asking it to take a chance and allow us to steer our life a bit more as we learn how everything is actually working. The questioner says, how do you mean it was protecting us before? Well, this is why sudden reactions take place. Without instructions, the brain helps you notice how something happening is just the same way that something had happened before in the past. It picks up a sight, a sound, an odor, or touch, or thought, and that is similar to what happened before, and then re-stimulates the same feeling that came up before. You mean that we're repeating past actions all over again? Yep, that's right. Human beings react about 80 to 85% of the time in their life instead of realizing what is actually happening in the present time event that's right here and now. And this is why they get unconsciously caught up in reacting. And instead of pausing to realize what is essentially going on, it's the present time, in the present time, and then responding. Then instead, they're reacting. She was, <laughs> why don't we learn this in school? You know, that I've been asking myself that same question for the past 10 to 12 years now. Our kids really don't get this in their health class education in the East or the West. You know, they hear about the body. They hear about the organs. They hear about the allopathic approach to medicine and disease and solutions. They don't hear much about the mental system and don't get that kind of education yet. But at some point, we are going to have to put it in our school systems. So why don't we learn it in school? Okay, so how, how can we stop the reactions and how can we change? We have to understand how change can happen. Anytime we wanna change something in our behavior, we have to honestly see the habit repeating a lot first. We have to identify it. And then we can stop a moment and let that habit go. And then we change? Well, for a moment, maybe. But when we really want to change, we need to see the rising of the old habit and think for a moment, just never mind, and let it go out of our mind and relax our head and smile as it is, just as, we, as if we were replacing it with a different wholesome kind of response. That's when you really begin to change. This will make things better for us and anyone else around us. As we begin purifying and retraining our brain like this, we are solidifying a new communication system with our brain. Is that good for us? Super good. Because when you get uptight with tension, when someone asks you to do something you don't want to do, your heart pumps faster, your circulation speeds up, you feel heat in your body, and you want to get defensive and ready, you get tense and ready to pounce back. And you want to, to get what you want to do. But that doesn't help your situation. Your parents are worrying a lot about you because school stopped and you were ripped out of a normal teenage cycle due to COVID. I don't think we think about what our parents are thinking about. I think we're worried about ourselves from 13 to 16 or so. 
They might also have been knocked off course. Lost the maid and the cook, if there was one in the house before, because they went home to the village. When the lockdown happened, I've heard a lot about this. But the house is still there. The living situation is now in need of group cooperation until things can normalize and everyone needs to work together in the family group situation to help with the chores and maybe others that maybe other people did before. And there's also a lot of pressure put on young people who had a routine before the lockdowns, but now things have changed. Here is a clear lesson in a Nietzsche for everybody concerned because suddenly, very suddenly, everything changed. And even now, you need a meeting each week or so just to see how things are still changing and understand that to survive everything, everybody has to help. So how should we work together to get along better in the living groups. For this, let's go into a sutta section from the Upakalesa Sutta first, where Venerable Anurad is telling the Buddha how he and three other monks managed to live together in harmony. And I'll tell you a secret about this section. I used to take this in Malaysia a couple times. I took it to um, youth groups and read it to them before they went on camping trips <laughs> because I thought it was a really good example for them, you know, to listen to how the monks were living together. You know, if we think of monks, we think, well, everything is great with them and they're all very holy and, you know, nothing could be the same as the way we live. That is so untrue. I mean, there is a great, they don't have the household concerns, but in their living structure, they do have a lot of the same things that you have when you're not in the monastic structure. The Buddha is speaking here to some of the monks that are living together in the sutta. I hope that you are living in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Now, if you, if you wanna know what that means, it's kind of fun. You get two glasses of water, you put them on the table. And the first thing you do is you pour some yellow sort of color oil into the water and watch what happens. It all floats to the top and sits there and the rest of everything is below it. It's not, uh, that's what happens. But then you pour some cream, it's best if you use cream into the water, just take uh, a little bit and just pour it in and watch how it just goes down in the glass and then it all blends like milk and water, but the oil doesn't do that. So the question is, what house do you live in? The one with the milk and water or the one with the oil and water? How are the relationships? And if they're like oil and water, we need to get them more like milk and water. So when he was asked the question, as to that, I think thus, he says, it is a gain for me it is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions in the holy life. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards these others, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards them openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards them, both openly and privately. I consider why should I not set aside what I personally wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do instead. Then I set aside what I wish to do and do what these venerable ones wish to do. We are different in body, venerable sir, but one in mind. 
So their thoughts, words, and deeds, they are practicing loving kindness. They are living loving kindness and checking themselves to see if it's loving kindness whenever they're doing a thought, a word, or a deed. How do you abide here? This is where they explain exactly how they handle everything. Whichever of us returns from the village in the morning with alms food prepares the seats. The first one that comes back prepares the seats, sets out the water for drinking and for washing and puts the refuse bucket in its place. Whichever of us returns last eats any food that is left over if he wishes. Otherwise, they throw it away where there is no greenery or drop it in water where there is no life. He puts away the seats and the water for drinking and for washing. He puts away the refuse bucket after washing it. He sweeps out the refectory, the kitchen area, the eating area. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing, or the latrine are low or empty takes care of them. If they are too heavy for him, he calls someone else by a signal of the hand because they're living in silence. And they move the bucket together by joining hands. But because of this, they do not break out into speech. But then every five days, we sit together all night discussing the Dhamma. And that is how we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. So this is a great example of cooperation between this group who are not living in any special kind of house, they're living in the forest or they're living on a cliff or in a cave or wherever they're located. These were living right under a bunch of trees. And here there is practice silent cooperation in all the work that is needed to do to live together. Okay, the second place that I want you to see something unique is about the management of how to behave when one is not in accord with another about some Dhamma point. In our case, in the house, it could be in accord about anything that we're discussing. We see here how they were advised to manage this first. And the Kinti Sutta, you turn these suttas around and make it so it's written to you in the lay life, all kinds of psychological instruction is in there when you do that. And then you test it. Does this psychological instruction make sense for the lay person? And most of it does. The second place we're going is the Kinti Sutta. And although the story is around the monks, it is true that these monks faced many of the same things you and I face living together as a group. So when one is in his stage of life where he is thinking more of himself than of the others in the group, disputes can arise just like they can in any home or any family. So when you listen to this, when I read it to you, put yourself in one of the places in the story. We hear here also what the Buddha taught for foundation training first, that all the monks should universally know very well. And what do we find? We find the 37 requisites of awakening that in this section here, just like we teach you when we're learning the twin practice. And then the sutta shows us how putting these two work together in their practice result in mutual appreciation of how each person is doing well in the group or having some kind of difficulty. There is then an example in, a, in the section five to eight 
you're going to get to keep this and they are labeled. So I gave you the whole entire suit in the end, I decided to give you the whole suit to print it up. There is then an example of communication when each person differs about the meaning and the phrasing of a word that is set. I'm sure this has happened to you amongst groups and families. And then comes, uh, that's in section five to eight. And then the, then comes the attempting to live in concord with one person commits an offense when that person commits an offense or a transgression, how they handled it to maintain harmony with and without resolving the thing, it makes it impossible to experience Nibbana. And this is what they're taught as monastics. But in the case of our own situations, reaching Nibbana could equal for us at this time, like attempting to reach any personal goal in our life, even remaining popular with our school friends outside of schoolwork or remaining in touch with the best contacts for work positions that we don't want to slip, we don't when we don't want our uh, career path to slip down, or keeping balance with other dedicated home domestic engineers, running a household or home executives with la very large households. And if you don't know those terms, those are housewives, but we don't call them that in the United States. A lot of times we'll take these other titles and say domestic engineer or home executive to run the household. And we are also, we should not fall behind in our progress due to what is left inside of us. This is the principle behind this part. Um, you know, when we have things that are unsettled and unforgiven and they're stuck inside of us, it's restlessness, guilt, and remorse that's inside us, not settled past disputes. Well, then we don't, things we don't want to let go of in section nine through 15. Well, we can see that this is in the same manner as our own living situations, this is true. Now, if we do not resolve any disputes as advised, then it is impossible to have good sleep, good health, good attention to tasks that we do, good progress in life when we do not carry inside restlessness, guilt, and remorse from unsettled disputes. But when we try to live without resolve, we do not progress in the present time due to the weight of not forgiving others or being forgiven ourselves systematically. And in our own settings, we need to give and receive forgiveness and keep on going without any baggage stuck in the past inside of us. In section 16, it becomes clear that without abandoning disputes, if one were to exalt themselves above others, one person, I'm more important than anybody else here. You have to do what I want to do. I don't care how the house is running. This is what I want to have happen. If that happens with anybody, any age group, one cannot attain success on what other path that one is attempting to follow. So in the example, the importance of getting good grades in this very disparaging time in COVID becomes very important because as a human resource person, I'm telling you this now, as someone who got people into jobs and all of them, and I'm putting this out to you. After COVID, students and people who were working through this time, they may also have to face different age progressions in education and work, and it's going to be difficult for them. So it's important somebody turns their microphone off. <laughs> I don't know which one it is. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the bottom line here in section 17, for the sake of all young and older people working now through school levels or through growth in their careers, many careers are set up where at a certain age or a certain number of years, you get certain promotions. It is of the utmost importance that the lessons here are discussed and seen as just as valuable for lay people as monastic group. 
So now, although I taught you this, um, keeping it in the form of the bhikkhus living together above, the lesson is, I'm going to probably do that now because I didn't change the words, but the lesson is unequivocally the same for any group of lay people living together today. So now just sit back and listen. The Kinti Sutta, Najima Nikaya, number 103. What do you think about me? Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Kusinara, in the Grove of Offerings. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. What do you think about me, monks? That the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of robes? Or that the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of alms food? Or does the recluse Gotama teach the Dhamma for the sake of a resting place? Or does the recluse Gotama teach the Dhamma for the sake of some better state of being? <clears throat> we do not think thus about the Blessed One. The recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of robes or for the sake of alms food or for the sake of resting place or for the sake of some better state of being. So bhikkhus, you do not think thus about me. Reclus Gotama teaches in that way, or for the sake of robes, for the sake of a better state of being, or what do you think about me? Venerable sir, we think thus about the Blessed One. The Blessed One is compassionate and seeks our welfare, and he teaches the Dhamma out of compassion. And so, monks, you think this about me. The Blessed One is compassionate and seeks our welfare, and he teaches the Dhamma out of compassion. So monks, these things that I have taught you after directly knowing them, that is the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right kinds of striving, the four bases of spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors in the Noble Eightfold Path. In these things, you should all train in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing. And while you are training in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, two monks might take different assertions about the higher Dhamma. They might have a discussion together and disagree. And if you should think thus, these venerable ones differ about both the meaning and the phrasing, then whichever bhikkhu you think is the more reasonable should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about both the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is difference about the meaning and difference about the phrasing. Let them not fall into dispute. And then whichever monk you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is a difference about the meaning and the difference about the phrasing. Let him not fall into dispute. So what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped, bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped. What is Dhamma and what is the discipline 
should be expounded. So you should talk about how you're going to settle this, how you're going to take care of it. Now, if you should think thus, these venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing, then whichever bhikkhu you think is the more reasonable should be approached and addressed. The venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is a difference about the meaning, but agreement about the phrasing. So let them not fall into dispute. They coached each other in groups, the monks, encouraged each other, reminded each other, don't fall into dispute. Simply keep examining, keep testing, keep seeing what it is that works. Then whichever monk you think is the most responsible of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason there is a difference about the meaning, but agreement about the phrasing. Let them not fall into dispute. And so what was wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped and what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind as rightly grasped. Bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped and bearing in mind what has been rightly grasped was rightly grasped. What is Dhamma? What is discipline? It should be expounded. Now, if you think thus, these venerable ones agree about the meaning, but they differ about the phrasing, then whichever bhikkhu you think is the more reasonable one should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones agree about the meaning, but differ about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is agreement about the meaning, but a difference about the phrasing. But the phrasing is a mere trifle. Let the venerable ones not fall into dispute over in a mere trifle. And then whichever bhikkhu you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones agree about the meaning, but they differ about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason there is an agreement about the meaning, but a difference about the phrasing. But the phrasing is a mere trifle. So they're just taking it as a trifle, whatever it is. Let the venerable ones not fall into dispute over a mere trifle. So what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind and rightly grasped. And what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped, bearing in mind what has been rightly grasped as rightly grasped and bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped. What is Dhamma and what is discipline should be expounded. Now, if you think, if you, you should think thus, these venerable ones agree about both the meaning and the phrasing, then whichever monk you think is the most reasonable should be approached and addressed. Thus, the venerable ones agree about both the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones agree, what uh, venerable ones should know that it is for this reason there is an agreement about both the meaning and the phrasing. Let the venerable ones not fall into any dispute. Then whichever monk you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached 
and ad addressed thus, the venerable ones agree about both the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know it is for this reason that there is agreement about both the meaning and the phrasing. Let the venerable ones not fall into dispute. So what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind as rightly grasped. Bearing in mind what has been rightly grasped as rightly grasped, what is the Dhamma and what is discipline should be expounded. When you are training in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, some monk might commit an offense or a transgression. Now monks, you should not hurry to reprove him. Rather, the person should be examined thus in this way. I shall not be troubled and the other person will not be hurt for the other person is not given to anger and resentment. He is not firmly attached to his view and he relinquishes easily, lets go of it. If he disagrees, he lets go easily. And I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. If such occurs to you monks, it is proper for you to speak. If you feel like you can, you can talk to them and they won't be hurt by the discussion, you can go on being sensitive with the person. And then it may occur to you, I shall not be troubled, but the other person will be hurt for the other person is given to anger and resentment easily. They get angry easily. However, he is not firmly attached to his view and he relinquishes it easily. I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him to the wholesome. It is a mere trifle that the other person will be hurt, but it is a much greater thing that I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. If such occurs to you, because it is proper to speak. The person disagrees with you, but they're not and they are easily, they are easily get upset, but they can let go and still listen. So that's okay, you can talk to them. Then it may occur to you monks, I shall be troubled, but the other person will not be hurt. For the other person is not given to anger and resentment, though he is firmly attached to his view and he relinquishes it with difficulty, yet I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. It is a mere trifle that I shall be troubled, but it is a much greater thing that I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. If such occurs, to you monks, it is proper to speak. Remember, a lot of people disagreed with what Gotama was teaching. So when they discussed things, sometimes this was where people could get angry very easily. This twisty turny, the reason I gave you this whole sutta was so you could read it a few times with a pen to figure out the pieces, but it is pretty good. Then it may occur to you because I shall be troubled and the other person will be hurt. For the other person is given to anger and resentment and he is firmly attached to his view and, re and re he relinquishes with difficulty. That's the person that just gets mad if you disagree with them at all. And they're not gonna let go. And yet I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. It is a mere trifle that I shall be troubled and the other person hurt, but it is a much greater thing that I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. If such occurs to you monks, it is proper to speak and continue the conversation. And then it occurs to you monks, 
I shall be troubled and the other person will be hurt. For the other person is given to anger and resentment, and he firmly uh, is firmly attached to his view. He relinquishes it with difficulty. I cannot make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. At that point, one should not undertake equanimity towards such a person. It means go home, walk away, <laughs> let it go. Bye. <laughs> That's what it means. While you are training in accord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, there might arise mutual verbal friction, insolence, insults people saying nasty things to you right in your face in their views and remarks, mental annoyance, bitterness, and dejection. Then whichever monk you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the one part should be approached and addressed thus. While we were training in Concord Friend with mutual appreciation without disputing, there arose mutual verbal friction, insolence in views, mental annoyance, bitterness, and dejection. And if the recluse knew, would he censure that? Answering rightly, the bhikkhu would answer thus. While we were training in that way, if the recluse knew of that, he would censure that. But friend, after abandoning that thing, can we realize Nibbana? Answering rightly, the bhikkhu, the other monk, would answer thus, friend, without abandoning that thing, one cannot realize Nibbana. This is where it's stuck inside. If you do not let go, if you do not forgive, it doesn't take long to forgive. You did take, you know, I know there are there's a lot of tough stuff that goes on between parents and children. And you get to an age between maybe 12 and 16 where it's a tough time, you know? And then you feel like you're seeing you're able to do so much more and in, in charge of your life, but your parents want whatever they do. And you're not seeing it from their eyes. They weren't really trying to protect you but you don't see it and it seems like they're coming down on you. And that's where it's time to sit down and talk a little closer about what's going on in the household to get harmony back, find harmony. Because sometimes it's a good idea to, in your mind, really try to imagine the story of your parents. And your parents are going through COVID and their child who was going through normally in school has been abruptly cut off from normal development as a teenager in school. Their clique, their group, their sports, their everything gone, everything shut down immediately. I can't imagine what that would have been like in high school. It would have been terrible for that to happen. With that gone, that's on your side, devastation and suffocating. There was a story about a woman in, actually it was a clip, she put it online, when she told her daughter, I forget what state it's in in the United States, that the schools were opening again in their area. Her daughter was about 13 or 14 years old and just broke down and cried and was shaking all over. She had suffocated her feelings about how she felt about the devastation of losing her friends, seeing them every day, all the things she was involved in at school, gone, just like that, okay. And we think, well, our parents don't have any idea, but on the other side, the parents are desperately out of any way of controlling what has happened. And they love you and they wanna protect you and they want to make sure this turns out all right for you, but they have no control. The governments around the world are in control and that's it. 
Now, the thing is here, if you throw a year at this point, I want to make sure that if you're young and you're listening to me tell you this, it's not going to be easy for all of the corporations and everybody to accept the fact that you're this age and you're here when you should be over there. It's not going to be easy as it goes through with all the different situations. Keeping up in school is vitally important right now. And the best thing I can tell you is this. Everybody in a family has a job. And sometimes we don't get the point when we're young people. Our job is our school. That is our job until we were on our own. Our job for ourselves to be happy, to be balanced in harmony, for the household to be balanced in harmony. And if you harmonize your house together, then believe me, everybody's going to feel better. And so you kind of let it go. It's like, that's not that is what's that phrase. It's not that important or whatever it was. You know, it's a trifle. It's a trifle because this way you're moving forward all the time in a present time bubble. That's where you live. You don't have to carry what happened this morning into the rest of the day. And you need to look at cooperation and compromise, compromise. And be aware of certain things. In your teen years right now, I know you're a lot brighter than my kids were or I ever was at, from nine, nine years old forward. <laughs> I tell people if I want anybody to fix my phone or my computer, all I need to do is rent a nine-year-old. <laughs> and they know everything. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, compromising is the answer learning how to make a deal so that you can still see your friends so much time but you have to get your grades up to see them longer than that you can't expect to decide to take three four hours out away and then not have your grades slip unless you're one of those people with 140 iq and you just look at the book and do the answers most of us are not there, okay? So that what you have to do is you have to compromise and make deals with your parents in your, in your house. The story of the girl who wanted to go buy shoes and her mother wanted her to clean her room before she went with her friends and she didn't want to. But how much time would it take if the two of them were cleaning her room and the two of them were cleaning up the kitchen and the living room together? And then she went with her friends and, she, and, and her mother stayed there and her grandmother came to visit. No problem. But there wasn't anybody to help the mother anymore. You see? So make deals because part of your life education is making deals and cooperating with that kind of thing. The next one here is whatever you think is the most reasonable thought whose sides together on the opposite side should be approached and addressed thus while we were training in Concord, friend, and mutual appreciation without disputing, there arose some verbal friction. It means we said things we didn't agree and we got in friction insolence in views saying nasty things to each other you see that happened there with monks too you see that and mental annoyances and bitterness and dejection because they got it inside and they hadn't learned yet that they have a present time car to live in a present time bubble they don't have to carry around what happened before while we were training the recluse, if the recluse knew, he would censure that. But friend, without abandoning that thing from your mind, can one realize Nibbana? And the monk has to answer it. One cannot do that. One cannot realize. In our case, of we talk about Nibbana. 
Can we accomplish what we're trying to do? No. Can we concentrate? No. You have to learn to let go and compartmentalize your life and be where you are at that present time and put yourself fully into it. That's the most successful person in the world. If others should ask the monk, was it the venerable one who made those monks emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome? And answering rightly, the monk would answer, here, friends, I went to the blessed one. The blessed one taught me the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, I spoke to those monks. And the monks they heard the Dhamma and they emerged from the unwholesome and became established in the wholesome. And answering thus, the monk neither exalted himself when he said that or disparaged others. He simply answered in accordance to the Dhamma in such a way that nothing which provides a ground for any censure could legitimately be deduced by his assertion. When he says he learned the Dhamma, what did he learn? He learned to live in the present time. He learned to let go of things from the past and not be worried hyper about the future until it's here and it's time to take care of that. And this is what the Blessed One said and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So I'm going to throw... Um, stop this here okay come back to you all and come back and say come on do you see what this is about you see and it's it's about the age group of the people involved and it's about the, the things that young and middle and older all have in common and it's all about living together hi sarah hi got one question I've got yes, I've got one question. So from from the, the sutta here, um, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely construction. Uh, but what if there is a isn't agreement about what is wrongly grasped? It's a trifle. Let it go. Go sit uh, under go sit under a tree with your meditation and just you know. The thing is, he tried to be clear. You know, if it's going to really you have to judge the person you're dealing with. And it's, it's true with um, monastics and lay people, <laughs> the same thing. You cannot speak to certain uh, other monastics about certain topics. They just get very hot and, and they don't back off and they're not open just the way normal people are. Or you find someone who is willing to sit down and look at all the sides of things and see. Now, the most interesting thing to me about the Buddhist teaching is, you know, all of this is does it operate or not? It's all we have. You know, we don't have anybody who was there with the Buddha and can come here and say, yep, that's what he said. That's what he meant. That's how you do it. Everything boils down to, does it operate or not? Okay, then the person says, define operate. Okay. Uh, basically, this was a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, and gradual progress. All human beings are not the same, so different people are going to take different periods of time to get it this way or that part of it, you see. So your learning levels are different. Your realization is different. So what he stressed most was the damage of dispute. That was what he was stressing the most, I think, in the sutta, because the, the damage through making a decision, we're all going to dispute, is very damaging. It's like putting a poison seed in here. And if you don't have the lesson of past, future, and present time clear, then you don't just say, it's a trifle. I'll just be here and continue my practice. And then perhaps present it again tomorrow at lunch and see if they see it, if I say it a little differently, you see, that sort of thing. Yeah? Is that where, am I on target? Yeah? 
Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, can that I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, Sarma. Yeah. So my question is about you know uh, uh, in uh, daily life, does it uh, mean that you become a doormat and not respond or react to anyone in any way, you know, <laughs> even if you're offended? Nowhere in the Buddhist text, anywhere, does it instruct the person to sit down and be a doormat. And some people don't realize this. I have a very dear friend who is probably going into the 12th year of a dispute with a man who once actually the property her father owned, it was a vacant lot next to that man's house where he built it. And they are still fighting about that. And she actually got sick over it and she lost her job over it. And she had to go home and make money at home in order to survive this whole thing. And I can, I finally got to, I was trying to let her figure this out. And finally, I told Bonte, I have to just come out and say it. And he said, well, I expected you to. And I finally said, this is a test for you from the universe about renunciation. It's an acre, a half acre lot of land. Give it to him or just give it, let it go. It's not worth your human life. You know, it's not. This man was paying off the judges, paying off the police, paying off the lawyers, making them quit her case. She had to get more and different ones every couple of years. This was, and she thought, but I have to be a good Buddhist. And what's good about this? Nothing in the text anywhere says you are supposed to become a doormat. You have legs, Sarma? Yes. If you have legs, then you need to walk away. When it gets to that point, just walk away because you have to go in your mind. What in the whole world is there that you would hold on to so hard you would be willing to be a doormat? Think about it. Can you you see the question? So tell me what it is. But where is the where is the where is it? You, you see what I'm saying? It's just not there. I looked for her. I really did. I looked in the text every. I kept it in my mind all the time, reading everything. Sutta Nikaya, Nikaya. There's nothing there. I asked the Vivamsas from Burma, "Is it there? The ones that have the whole thing in their head? It's not there." You should be able to stand up with pride that you are a Buddhist. There's nobody should be able to beat you up. The problem here is in today, a lot of people don't know what the Buddha taught and they don't know what they're supposed to be proud of. You see, that's true. I have young people that have come and said, what am I supposed to do? They're picking on me and they're beating me up because I'm a Buddhist, blah, 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 blah. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, what's going on and when I listened I realized the person didn't know anything about what it was so how could they be proud of it and there certainly is something to be proud about because he doesn't the Buddha doesn't dawdle he says it directly he doesn't order you or tell you or command you about anything the everything he tells you is based on go test it see if it works if it does, use it. If it doesn't, okay, drop it. I told people once at a retreat, if you don't like this, then, then when you leave, take this thing we printed for you and put it in the trash and that's the end of your retreat. It's fine with me. It doesn't bother me at all. But I'm hoping that if you sit for even a few hours, you might be able to see something that is what I found and what I realized. And what I know, you see, but it's entirely up to the person. Yeah. No doormat. No, no, no doormat. <laughs> yeah. So, um, sorry. And, and, uh, okay, can you, okay, can you hear me? Oh, wait. Oh, okay. All right. 
Um, let me put my mic on. So I'm going to put your mic, mute your mic, and I'll mute mine. And let me see if it works better for her. Okay, okay. So this is about, about the female. The last, the last, the last female. Bharat and I are sitting in the same room and they have different uh, instruments. So that's why that echo came. Okay, what's all right, so my question is on the Kinti Sutta. And in the end, uh, you know, when there is a dispute and when you have a dispute with a person, so the Buddha has uh, spoken about various things. One is that if you are troubled, uh, that is one point. The second is if the person that you are going to talk to with whom you have a dispute, uh, if they are the sensitive sort and get hurt, uh, that's the second thing. And if they are given to anger and resentment, their disposition, the third thing. And the fourth thing, according to me, I mean, according to the Buddha, what I understood was whether you are able to help that person go from an unwholesome stand to a wholesome stand. Now, if whether, whether you are troubled or not is trifle, whether the person gets hurt or not is a trifle, whether they are given to anger and resentment is a trifle. Whether they are not, they don't easily relinquish their views is also a trifle. But the most important thing is whether you are able to convince the person to go from an unwholesome point of view to a wholesome point of view. Now, that is all fine. And he says that if you are not able to, so in all the other matter, times you can speak up. But if you think that you are not going to be able, if this person will not uh, be able to go from an unwholesome point of view to a wholesome point of view, then you have to establish, I mean, you know, look at it with equanimity. Now, my question is that unless you try, unless you try talking to the person and uh, try to change their view from an unwholesome uh, state of mind to a wholesome state of mind, how will you know? So you will, you will have to speak up in the first instance to know whether that person is, if you are able to change the person's mind or not. This is Isn't doctor's it? perspective. This is doctor's perspective. What perspective? Doctors. No. <laughs> doctors. Uh. Okay. I want to know Mataji's view. Okay, Mataji let, her, let, let, her, let us on, wait. Uh, let us wait. You have to give your own mute. The way that I take this to mean isn't particular. This is if the person is hurt. Yeah, this is if the person is hurt. Should you? Okay. Not necessarily on the point that you were speaking about, but can you help them understand how they become hurt and how it works and how you reach equanimity to be able to discuss things? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because, I mean, I can remember personally before um, I was with Bonte where I had a terrible time with that, just terrible, you know? I didn't have the ability, I didn't know anything, and I certainly didn't know about an existence of equanimity and balance. I didn't know any such thing, okay? So if a person were hurt over what we're speaking about, not speaking about what we're hurt, but how did you get hurt in a conversation between two people, and are you interested in how this works? And you know what? I've had people open up the door and learn enough dependent origination that they understand how they were getting in trouble with being hurt. Then if you want to, this is almost, you know, when I, this is almost when I was talking to the monks about uh, mental health and talking about depression and the issue of medication versus Buddhism. And the idea is Buddhism enough for a trauma person to help them. And my position was no, and they were surprised. And that was no, because of the one thing the medical community is good at in the allopathic medicine is an emergency. 
I won't, you know, it's not necessarily good at some kinds of med medical attention, in my opinion. This is, I think, Alia, I mean, the, I think that the uh, uh, alternative way is, is better in a lot of things. But in an emergency and a collapse of someone who can't speak, is crying uncontrollably, and is going through traumatic episodes, you need to have something to stabilize them before you can communicate with them. This is the point I tried to get across to them. And they have to under, and people have to understand that in that kind of thing, what I'm against, and I'll be open about it, is uh, life putting a person on a lifelong kind of drug with the belief and no hope they could ever get out of it when the risk of side effects is so high and the person who's being treated is not told about it. See, that's where I was with that. In this case is a much smaller thing, but if I hurt someone's feelings, I wouldn't necessarily give up with them, but I could make a path around to get to the idea of what about talking about, have you ever wondered how the emotional hurt actually happens? That was true with the lady who um, was about to, to uh, her husband was about to divorce her and she had a, um, a serious depression and was being treated on medications. And uh, her family was about to fall apart and the eye-opening thing for her was for me to show her a picture of dependent origination. And she really, really got it. And why, why was it so eye-opening was because she had taken personally the Atta perspective and fully and completely believed that I said to her, how would this, when I listened to her whole story, how would it be for you if I could prove to you your depression is not you? Well, that was enough right there. So we sat down for an hour and a half at a coffee table and got paper out and drew the chart and discussed it and went through it a number of times until she started crying. I said, are you okay? Oh, I am. Because finally someone has told me this is not mine and I'm not guilty or to blame. This is something that happens to people through a misunderstanding how this works, like me telling you, um, you know, you're, you're very upset because your clock is broken, your watch, the old fashioned watch, and it's only because you don't understand how it works that you're so upset about it. And that was what ran in my head was about a watch, a clock with all the pieces, and I had given her the pieces. And when I left, I was in tears almost. I went to Bonte and said, you'll never guess what happened. I went up there to get the email and this is what happened. <laughs> and I told him the whole story, but I was like, I couldn't believe that I was, I was trying to learn it at that point. So I wanted to see if I could show someone else. She was the first person. So what happened was within three months, she was reducing her drugs. And she had, I guess, I'm, I'm guessing, but I think she took the chart to the psychologist or psychotherapist and convinced him to take a look and understand because, and she told me in a note, she wrote me once that even if somebody had told her they didn't understand it, she said, it's okay, I understand it. And I'm like a hundred percent better because I'm not you know, going to be thrown away. And her husband understood it within the first two or three weeks, something drastically changed in her, in her demeanor and everything. So the, there are ways of communicating. And one of the reasons I believe the Kinti Sutta put the 30, uh, 37 requisites of enlightenment in the front section of the Sutta, in the third of the very third section mentions it, points it out. That's what these monks have in their minds to work with, you see? That's what they have in their minds. Every one of them knows those 37 requisites of enlightenment. And so with that, armed with that, when you have someone who perhaps got hurt by the conversation, I mean, I have an exquisite example of, <laughs> of you know, uh, somebody getting hurt in a, uh, a conversation <laughs> where the person was ill with a temperature and then tried to manage something uh, online and then uh, 
said something and the person at the other end, they heard it and assumed it meant something else. But the person who was sick had decided I've had enough and went to bed that night and didn't, by the way, check the, the thing for about two or three days because they were so sick, so sick, you see. And comes out, that person thought that the person who was sick called him a Nazi, for heaven's sakes. And that that's what the person said. But when the person who was sick found out that this happened, <laughs> they just didn't quite know what to do and just decided not to get online for about six months or so anymore because of the chance of things being misunderstood. <laughs> It was a very sad situation of immediate assumption and then a lot of people getting mad at that person for what they said when they never said what the other person interpreted at all. Never, never, never in a million years. It was a tragedy. Well, this could have gone that way. This situation could have gone that way. So you, you have all these tools of the third section of the Kinti Sutta to work with. In, amongst that, by the way, is what? What's in there that we know about? Yeah, right striving is right effort automatically happening in these months. You got that? We've established now for sure that right effort when we call it right striving, it means right effort is happening in the person automatically. Okay, and you, if you have to dig to a lot of sutras to get there, but it's there, it's, you can really prove it, okay? So if they were practicing that, if, if that's what was happening, then they have even that to work with. So let it go, you know? This is a game of never mind, let it go, relax, smile, come back. And then see what you can talk about. And my, my I'm always saying, <laughs> take the person out for ice cream, apologize if you said something they didn't understand for heaven's sakes and go on, you know? That's what needs to happen. The only problem with this world, think about it, Sarma, think about the world. How do wars start? That's an interesting question. Well, I came to the conclusion about 10 years into this whole adventure of mine that war happens when one of the two sides, it could be a person, a family, a community, or whatever, one of two sides, okay, takes action based on assumption without information. You see? That's how war starts. And hurt and pain and a lot of suffering. So what do we have to do? You have to send me to the UN and I'll start teaching them right effort. <laughs> they all need to agree to practice it, all of them at one time and have a meeting because here's what happens. My children grew up in the last 15 years or 20 years watching peace conferences happen. And what do we see? We see a picture of all the people lined up going into the peace conference and all of them coming out and saying, hi, we did it. You know, we had a peace conference. What do we get? Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because people are not educated enough in the basics of natural law and how all of this works. So, you know, Sama came to the peace conference. He had a great idea, but you know, Sarah was there and she said, oh, we can't do that. And why'd she say we can't do that at the table? Why'd you do that? Because Sarma always does this. See, that's pointing to Sarma in the, and, and it could be Syria, Egypt, all the named countries. I got sick of it. I don't even want to watch them anymore. They're like a bunch of naughty children in nursery school and nobody will shut that school down. <laughs> you know, that's the way I see it as a mom. Nobody will turn that off. The best talk we ever heard one year at the UN was given by a 12 year old where they let that girl go in there and tell that group of people what they were doing to her future. And they all got up, stood up, gave her a standing ovation and went back to work. Yeah, right. <laughs>
but that was the best the best uh speech anybody made that whole year was what that girl went in and was allowed to say so what do we do we're not doormats ever <laughs> Not ever okay, and, and we when if we hurt somebody's feelings, we should forgive me. You know, say forgive me. I uh, and the person should have forgiveness. For it. I put it in the order of forgiveness and then compassion because there's you have enough space for the person to speak and not get upset with them, and then loving kindness. Forgiveness, compassion, and loving kindness. You won't, if anybody here has done forgiveness, then you, if you followed the instructions, you went outside and walked one foot, the other foot, the other foot, and started saying, I forgive you, and you forgive me, and I forgive you, and you forgive me for half an hour, and then went back and started sitting again. If you did the practice, why were you asked to do that? Boom, 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 forgive, 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 forgive. That's why you did it. See, so it's a methodology. He had a lot of methodology. This Buddha is really something. <laughs> He's really, really something. It's from a country girl. <laughs> just say that's a, he just amazing the, the explanations he had. Sarma, what you got? Yes. In the beginning, there are seven ways of learning the Dhamma you have spoken. Is it uh, Upanisha Sutta or something? It was mentioned in the beginning of the. Upanisha, in the Upanisha Sutta? Uh, yes, you mentioned seven ways of learning the Dhamma. Is it connected to Darukandaka Sutta? Buddha says, Seven days of uh, no, no. I wasn't giving you no. I wasn't giving you. I didn't give you that for that reason. If we go back, um, you know, I should have written the other line first. Okay, in the Ganaka Mogalana Sutta, which is one hundred and seven. I want to say, okay, in section three of one hundred and seven. I didn't have time to go back over this. I just finished typing it and came into class. But so, so that, okay, in section two of Ganaka Mogalana Sutta number 107, it says um, where they're practicing, they are practicing a way of gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That is down to the last step of the staircase. In other words, deeper and deeper and deeper observation is the way they look at this in this in this sutta. And when you're looking at it, how is it happening to you? And I related to you, it's happening this way, the same way as the rain pours down in thick droplets on the mountains. So they're just water droplets and the water flows down along the slopes and it fills the cleft and the gullies and the creeks. And these being full, it fills up the pools. And these being full, it fills up the lakes. Lake, huh? These being full, it fills up the streams. These mm. being full, it fills up the rivers. Mm. And these being full, fill up the great ocean. So when you look at this, it's the seven, seven stages of, I guess you could say it's seven like so, uh, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five, seven. six, seven, seven steps going, seven steps of traveling down deeper and deeper into the Dhamma. And I brought up the ocean because many people say the ocean of wisdom, the term ocean of wisdom. And so when you're reaching the ocean of wisdom, you're going down this mountain. I like this particular prose because it's water just flows. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I'm attempting to teach you is what effortless effort actually meant in the Buddhist texts. Effortless effort has been defined as something else modern by some modern teachers, but effortless effort 
is the the fading away of all hindrances for instance when i teach you about hindrances i'm showing you the effortless effort way of removing all hindrances am i not i am because i am showing you exactly how those hindrances operate the food that feeds them and keeps them coming back if you still have any thought of them in your mind, you're feeding them and they're going to come back and get the next meal. So the question is, can you actually let go, relax and smile and come back and smile, see? So everything we do in the Buddhist system, everything he was doing as the meditation was this communication training with the brain. And I think, Sue, so, I've been thinking about this, this the whole week <laughs> we've been doing writing all over the place uh but um the mind and the brain and there was one other word all mean the same thing you see they mean the same thing so when i talk about the mind uh and the reason i got on this kick about this is because dr punaji was right about that i knew him and I talked to him about it. I liked it the way he explained that there is no such thing as mind. <laughs> no such a thing as mind. So when they were talking about mind, they were talking about the organ of the brain. Now look at your, your Buddhist uh, teaching from the angle of mind was the brain because with the new neuroscience and the neuroplasticity, we know how we can train a brain by continual impingement on that brain of the new habit we want to establish and no attention being paid at all to the old habit. And the old one dies because it doesn't have food, as the Buddha put it. The nourishment is removed, therefore there's no reason for the battle because the army knows where the supply route is and we're gonna cut off the supply route from the enemy. <laughs> you know, I, I was put in a position once to teach a whole room of ex soldiers and military people whom I knew very well. There were at least five or six of them sitting amongst the 30 people there. I knew there were at least five or six of them who had struggled really difficultly with the hindrances, really hard fighting them, who would sit down at lunch anytime you wanted them to, to tell you about the enemy and how horrible this was and how they had to fight to destroy, annihilate, eradicate, suffocate, suppress, and subdue the enemy. And then what do we find in the Samyutta Nikaya? What do we find just in, forget the Samyutta Nikaya, what do we hear the Buddha adamantly explaining to the monks again in 22 in section six? What, do, what does he say? He tells you basically that no obstacle arising will ever become an obstruction unless you engage it. You couldn't be more clear than that one sentence that happens in 22. And you have to really know how this is. Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? This is where the monk believed it was okay to engage the distraction. Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them? So it means that the obstacle cannot become an obstruction unless I personally give it my attention. So this is yet another confirmation that the Atta needs to go home, have a relaxation in Cancun on the beach, <laughs> and Anatta can stay here. <laughs> you know, let it go. And every time you catch yourself, um, you know where I catch myself right now, be, I'll confess to you, <laughs> is that the, pup, the puppy is no longer the puppy, wants to go out on the street with the other dogs in the middle of the night, and it's difficult to get a sound sleep. 
So, I, and when I get annoyed, I sit up and talk to Atta. <laughs> I sit up and start laughing and saying, oh, Atta, you really, really, really want to do something <laughs> to the dog. And the dog needs to, the problem is that the puppy's mother is on this street, see? And I, when I try to tune into the dog, oh, that I just want to cry. This is a dog devoted to his mother. He has found his mother and he wants her to be able to come and get fed too. And he wants to go out and play with his mother. <laughs> I can't let him outside because of the ticks and fleas and stuff. And I'm allergic to fleas. And I finally got the fleas off the dog. So now I'm trying to figure out how to get the shot from America. They have a new shot for dogs. This is wonderful. Sh shot for the dog. One time, one year, no fleas. <laughs> this is a great invention. But I don't know when India will ever be in touch with that. It's not on the top of the priority list, you know. So I don't see it coming. Yeah, <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> But that's my Atta. Yeah, the Atta, you not to there. <laughs> Very few places it'll get me, but sometimes it will get me still, I'll tell you what. <laughs> yeah, Sarah. You were saying um, earlier on about how our brain is trying to protect us. And that's the, the automation of the, the processes that we do that shortcut that leads us into reacting rather than responding. And you also said about um, how we're setting up trust, trust with the brain to take a chance to allow us to steer with how everything is working. And so my, my question is around the trust. Because I, I, I feel this is really, really important and it's a real key to how all the water can flow everywhere. And so the, the, the question is really, where, where do you feel the trust is being created? I don't think it's important to know like that part of the, uh, like analyzing the thing, unless you want to go talk to the neuroscientists, okay? But I'll try to explain it. I'm a very simple person. And when all this stuff everyone explained to me about the brain, it became obvious to me the brain is about two or three years old. That's about it, <laughs> okay? And um, it knows, it, 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 it's structured into the brain. It is a built-in system of protection by protection. What I'm talking about, the brain doesn't lead you anywhere. You do, <laughs> okay? The brain doesn't lead you into suffering you said lead you into suffering i don't know if you meant it or not but the brain oh. is, well actually you probably did because you didn't want to say i lead myself into suffering right. so you said the brain leads me into suffering so you're still caught on the brain is me that's okay i had a lot of work to do with that too <laughs> okay but here the lead into suffering but here's the thing um the trust thing that becomes obvious when you're working with counseling people, especially if you get involved with veterans PTSD in any way, trauma, post trauma stuff like that, or depression and stuff, the, the thing that holds a person back from getting well is the fact that um, they don't wanna let this stuff come up. And they think it's them, they're punishing themselves for not letting it come up. But there is a built-in thing in your brain and part of the, the reason these people have PTSD is because the brain protected them from dot, let's take a military situation with a guy who, in a firefight who ends up with PTSD. The brain protected that guy for three years before he had an incident come up. And the brain made him forget the incident, covered it up. We know this happens. My neighbor, she had an a, a accident where she rolled in a vehicle without a safety belt. She had no business being alive. And she lost two hours of that accident. We know that the brain does this to protect the person. That's what I'm talking to you about, okay? So when you decide to... Um, if you were a PTSD victim, 
and you were having post-traumatic episodes and you decide you want to clean this whole thing up, part of the deal is you have to build up the communication with your brain like a little child. You know, it's okay for me to do this. I used to take walks and I used to, I used to take walks and have discussions with my brain. I'm just letting you know it's okay for me to handle this now. I'm a big girl. It's okay for me to look at what happened completely and, and see that. And the Buddha speaks about PTSD in 128, if you go to Upakalesa Sutta and go to the last section in that uh, sutta, you will find, this is like the Buddha saying, uh, when I saw that it was an imperfection, I abandoned it, okay? Now, in my own case with fear of heights that happened, if you all have heard me tell the story, when I was, doing past life regression and I saw how the people died in the other five lifetimes from falling. Then I said, that's enough. I don't need any more. I don't need a hundred of them. I can I get it. I get it. This is coming from some karmic thing because I was never afraid of heights until all of a sudden at 51 years old, this happened. I mean, I could climb trees 80 feet up I could do amazing things with heights. Let's just leave it at that, okay? And all of a sudden it was gone. So by recalling these things and witnessing them the way someone would witness these five incidents in deep meditation, then it was gone. And I could climb the fire tower, it was, I was free of it. I did that with another woman with an incident where she couldn't sit in any deeper than five inches of water in the river to play with her children. And we figured out that she had drowned probably. And I, she got stable enough and I worked with her and she came out the same way. I came out once she saw something else in another lifetime where people died by drowning, see? So something is going on with our brains where they're working as a protective system so the person doesn't see that thing that almost, almost killed, in the case of the firefight, it almost killed that guy. If he had recalled it at the time it happened, if he had not frozen, and they, uh, one doctor told me when the person froze like that, at the end, froze, they didn't go into full shock. The brain took it and locked it up in a closet in your head. And then later, three years into this, he starts having PTSD, uh, post-traumatic episodes. And the reason it happens uh, is because it's coming out slowly. So, you know, you can help the person in a safety environment, different ways, and there are different techniques that psychiatrists use, psychologists and, you know, psychotherapists, I think side by side is the best way to work with this because they have the ability to stabilize the person. And then we can't just take a person off the street and teach them to do recall. It doesn't work that way. You have to be in very strong equanimity in your sitting where you are aware you're Firmly, 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 this is what Bhante was doing, <laughs> firmly, are you firmly uh, in the position where you know that nothing you're going to see is real here and now? Otherwise, that guy would have jumped out the window and killed himself, you see, if it started happening. And they've been known to do this in those situations of real heavy, heavy problems with PTSD, right? So stabilization and then helping the person to figure out how to do it. But the brain, when I'm talking about communication, I'm talking about you connecting with your brain so that you can eventually, the idea behind this is eventually you, you, you uh, mastery of determine. You start determinations in the beginning of your training, but you, we're not telling you a whole lot about what they're for. <laughs> but later on, when you get bored in your practice and you want to do something and you've been into the mental realms and you've got some good equanimity, if you're just bored and you want to do something different, 
you can say, teach me how to do determinations. And Bonte's good at that. I'm not very good at the training system because I haven't spent enough time because I just wasn't interested. But he can teach people how to do it. And then it's totally up to the person doing it if they do it or not. You see, because it's a lot of work, you know, because you're doing it. Uh, first, you're doing it waking up for a week and then you're doing it in sitting in a particular jhana for so long and coming out and then you're learning how to do that in each one of the individual jhanas. And after that, you're learning how to go in for 60 seconds into the first jhana, two minutes into the third, one minute or two minutes in the, in the second and five minutes into the, like that. And you set up a frame. So what are you doing? Tell me what you're doing. You're setting up a communication, a genuine communication with the brain. Is it going to follow your instructions and intentions? Now, you all, do you have any experience with this already? Did you learn to practice with us? And did you do the other people? Did you do the other people? Sure. You practiced the other people. And yeah. when the feeling moved out, do you remember mm -hmm. practicing the other people do you remember, uh, then you did the six directions, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Those two exercises, the first one, especially, you did something with one person until something happened. Mm -hmm. And we asked you to do it with 11, uh, we meant, <laughs> uh, 15 more people, 16 people altogether, four, 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 and four. So we're asking you to do it with 15 more people quickly, aren't we? We're asking you to do it within one or two sittings. Can you do it again? So what did we do? We only asked you to do a dog trick. That's all. <laughs> we asked you to, to see if your brain is just a trick. Hey, brain, will you do this again and again and again and again, 15 times for me with three more normal spiritual friends, four family members, four neutral people, and at least four troublesome people or more if you want to. See, that's what we did. But why did we really do it? We did it just for the brain to see if you were connected with the brain, if, if the phone system was working, <laughs> connecting the wires through the phone system. That's all. So then by now, having done that, you should have been able to go to bed that night and gotten up within five minutes anyway of the time you said you were going to get up. And so when I get people who will play with me to actually do the stuff, it's really fun to see how precise they can get. Really fun. Yeah. And useful. Yeah. Okay. So that's, this is like connection, but I don't want to hear you say that your brain is leading you into suffering. You need to, that's what you said. And I need you to take a look at that now. Okay. I don't think I did say that. No, that's precisely what you said. And I wrote it down the moment that you said it. You go back to the recording. Well, I was trying to repeat yeah. what you said, which was to, to take a chance to allow us to steer with how everything is working. No, but when you were talking about it afterwards, you said lead into, I, I, I assume that you thought, I, I assume that this meant, and then you talked about it and you said, lead the brain, lead me into suffering. So what that's telling, that should be telling you is, <laughs> that somehow I believe my brain is leading me. And then the question is, if I believe my brain is leading me, what is that? That's me, me. I'm, le I'm leading myself into. So if it's Atta, then you start to practice separating Atta and Anatta and keep working until that disappears. So that's what you do. So when you turn up, that's why it's fun to ask people questions because if there's a piece in there, that I can pull out now, go back. And then whenever you are talking about this for somebody, listen very carefully to what you're saying. If you catch it, when you say, oh, I said that, there it is. This is not necessarily, I have to, see what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's good. It's good that you said that, <laughs> it's good, it's not bad, <laughs> okay, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Trusting is trusting the brain, trusting you, trusting the brain and the brain trusting you so that uh, when you want to take your loving kindness now 
and you want to send it to all the people in this ward in the hospital, you can stand in the hall and soak the word with loving kindness. You see, that's the kind of thing that we were doing before COVID happened anyway. <laughs> before that, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Hello, hello. Do you have anything left, Sarma? Yeah? Okay. We done? Are we done? Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Who's cock knocking? <laughs> <laughs> knock, knock. Yes, yeah, Sarma, one more question. Yeah? No, no question. No question. Okay. Okay. Oh boy. I'm not sure we shared my name. Yeah, but I have to ask a question either Barat or Perel. Stay on after we close down because I need you to help me do something really silly. I need to know how to work this again. <laughs> this is really funny. I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. I need to find out how to work this thermometer. <laughs> okay, please. Okay. All right, let's see this. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of our May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.